I think the discussion of the morning is appropriate to this season of the year. For while it is not essentially a devotional talk, it, I think, gives us some new dimensions and new recognitions of values in the descent of the Christian tradition. And in order to summarize the situation, we'll make an outline of the problems involved, but it is impossible in the time available to study the matter in depth. All we can do is mention a few of the outstanding circumstances. Up to the beginning of the fourth century, the Christian faith was very largely uh, distributed in rural districts, in desert regions, and the churches and communions were isolated from each other. Most of the members of these groups were illiterate, and uh, there was no actual organization or integration of what might be termed the basic doctrine. As 300 years nearly had passed, the isolated regions had developed not only their own peculiar viewpoints, but had already passed through several generations of conformity. The opinions of certain leading minds in these areas became orthodox and were perpetuated generation after generation. But in the different areas, these doctrines were not identical and in many cases not even similar. Each had its own interpretations, each had a combination of tradition and, we might say, romanticism, and the situation drifted along like this until an, an important occurrence took place which was to change the whole shape of Christendom. In uh, Alexandria in Egypt, which incidentally was the seat of the first seminary for the instruction of Christian priests, in Alexandria there was a very pious man by the name of Arias. This man differed from the prevailing doctrine of the Alexandrian synods. He decided that he could not conform with the teachings of the presiding bishop of Alexandria, whose name, incidentally, was Alexander. The bishop and Arias got into very serious conflict, and time went on, and there was considerable partisanism. Some of the bishops agreed with Arias, and this caused further consternation and uh, discomfort to the presiding uh, patriarch bishop. So, at finally, he called a synod in Alexandria in which about a hundred bishops and uh, other leaders of the communities uh, gathered and officially excommunicated Arias. The debate was largely concerning the essential nature of Christ. The problem was that Arias believed that Christ was a spirit that overshadowed and entered into the life of body of Jesus at the baptism. Uh, Alexander took an entirely different point of view and declared that in Jesus Christ, God himself as a person, personally incarnated. Well, it was an abstract problem and was one of many that have arisen in the descent of the faith. But in any event, Arias was excommunicated anathematized, declared to be a heretic and a traitor, and an incarnation of the Antichrist. This might have been all right in a sense, as far as Alexander was concerned, but he had made one serious mistake. He had brought a very major controversy into public consideration. The story went all through the various Christian communities and seems to have inspired a series of other schismatic uh, groups rising up with their own interpretations of these difficult subjects. Gradually, the Roman Empire became involved in a major dispute which threatened to break out into physical violence. In uh, 313 A.D., the Roman Emperor, Constantine the Great, had issued an edict to protect the Christians. There was to be freedom of belief within his domains. 
this was all right until this particular problem arose. And it looked as though the Christian community was going to be involved in a civil war, persecution, and other difficulties. Constantine, therefore, sent messages to both Arias and Alexander, asking them to reconcile their differences. Uh, they refused. He tried in every way possible to use his royal authority, but this was totally rejected. So after due consideration, possibly with the assistance of his secretary, a uh, Christian convert of Eusebius by name, he hit upon a plan. He was going to call the entire Christian world together in one great council to declare and decide upon what they all could agree upon. The result was the convening in 325 A.D. of the great uh, Council of Nicaea. This council, which met in what is now a Turkish town, brought together about 600 bishops, presbyters, and their attendants and associates. Constantine entertained them all at his own expense gave them living quarters and everything necessary, and appointed Eusebius as the secretary of the council. This seemingly was met with a certain amount of obedience, though not with too much enthusiasm, by most of the representatives of the various churches. Here we had these people, many of whom disagreed with each other, and before really they had settled down to consider anything, They'd, most of them had written private letters to the emperor, accusing one of the others of something. This was a little difficult, but the emperor was rather able to handle the uh, situation with imperial dignity. He burned all the letters. <laughs> Having disposed of this situation, he convened the council and addressed it in person. Now, it is probable that while most of those present had no interest in the emperor whatever, and did not care what he thought, there was one situation they couldn't entirely neglect. He had the power to be very difficult if they insisted on irritating him. So finally the council settled down. The principal recorder of the council was Eusebius, and unfortunately he had very little to say. Not very much is known as to the actual workings of this council. Many historians have been up against it, and uh, Eusebius' principal work, the ecclesiastical history, gives no clear indication of what was accomplished. It is known, however, that the Congress met, that there were many debates and discussions, and some way, somehow, uh, the problem of unifying the doctrines came into focus. Now we have to go back a little bit to another part of, of the situation. These old bishops and others who came to the uh, council, some, by the way, passed on en route and never got there. They were the oldest people in their communities, and the most venerated, and in most cases, each one had a doctrine very largely his own. There was no te New Testament at that time, but each of the little churches had some kind of a relic which they regarded as very sacred. In most instances, this relic was a book, or a part of one, or a few pages of one, or a few lines of one. It was never read. It was wrapped in cloth or silk or some precious substance, placed in an ark, and concealed in an opening in the altar. There it remained, generation after generation, worshipped but not read. Against this situation, there were a number of traveling priests and bishops who wandered up and down the countryside, visiting these small churches. These visiting uh, visitors brought with them the news of the great Christian community. They told about world affairs, they told about the various conditions of the churches, and they also uh, recited some parts of scripture, or some legend, or some story they had heard relating to the life of Christ and his apostles. In this same book of Eusebius, by the way, there are a number of appendices by other early Christian scholars, and one of them is quite interesting. It is a list of the twelve apostles and the seventy disciples of Jesus Christ. 
that this list is all named, numbered, and where they came from. And we know that the 70 has always been very important. But it is not noticed, at, at first at least, that it occurs in the, in the numbering of the apostles and disciples. In any event now, these uh, various prelates in their little local communities brought with them, at the imperial request, these fragments of sacred writings which had belonged to them, or transcripts thereof. In some cases, it is believed that the uh, message was brought orally by the representative, who may not have been able to make a transcript. But in any event, all of these ideas were put together. And then all of the various records, everything that was brought to Nicaea, relating to Gospels and to sacred writings, were put together to be considered for the compiling of a Bible. Now, this again is not clear in Eusebius. No one knows how uh, this selection was made. But it was a rather arbitrary one. And certain works were included and certain works were excluded by apparently a system of voting. In any event, at the end of it, these, these ra sacred writings were divided into two stacks. Those that were most generally accepted and voted as affirmatively divinely inspired. Those of doubtful origin or rejected works which were put to the other side. After the uh, uh, decisions had been made, and what we know now as the New Testament had been decided upon, the question is, what happened to the other books? This is a very moot question. Some feel that in all probability they were destroyed. Eusebius, however, does not say they were destroyed. It is quite possible that a number of the delegates went back to their own communities and continued to follow their earlier personal conclusions and convictions, and that the actual uh, decision of the Nicene Council was not followed completely. Out of the Nicene Council, however, there came uh, the first manuscript forms of the Bible. The, probably the most famous of these is the Sinaiticus, which was found in the monastery on Mount Sinai. It was for some time the possession of the Russian government and was later purchased by the British Museum. This is not a complete version. Parts are missing because the monks had already begun to throw away the old vellum as waste paper. But most of it was saved. And it is probably one of the most valuable manuscripts in the world. In this we have the gradually integrating outline of the present uh, form of the New Testament. It was in Greek, and the chances seem to be very good that the writing was actually done in Alexandria. Alexandria was the seat of the first, uh, second, and third important leader of the Christian community, and also a, an area of scholarship where scribes and translators could be found to do the most difficult works with considerable skill. And now the question arises, what happened to the books that were not accepted? Were they, were they rejected because truly and obviously they were not inspired? Were they rejected by uncertain votes? There is a report that some were uh, partly accepted and partly rejected, and that in some instances those accepted only got in by one vote. The, but the fact remains, what happened to the ones that didn't get in at all? It, is, it has been believed that these have to be classified under two general headings. The first is the heading in which surviving works are known. About 30 of the Christian uh, apocryphal and apocalyptical uh, write writings are extant. There are a number of fragments also that have been recently discovered. To add to these, perhaps the most important of all sources are the ones referred to by the early fathers prior to the Nicene Council, but not, never found. They are a number of quotations attributed to Christ and his apostles from Gospels that have never been rediscovered. It is not likely that the early church fathers fabricated these lines or these sections or these statements, 
But whatever happened, perhaps their sources were destroyed after the Council of Nicaea. In any event, there is probably a considerable group of sacred Christian writings that exist only as names and short quotations in the writings of other church fathers. Some were particularly well informed in this particular area and quoted many writers whom, whom we do not know today. The, the next problem would be to try to determine uh, the fate of those which did survive in some way. And here we have what we call the Christian Apocrypha. At the present time, approximately 30 books are known, in addition to the more complete uh, scriptures, which in the early printed editions did include some of the books now regarded as dubious. There is also an Old Testament Apocrypha, which we, which we won't be able to touch on today, but part of it, especially the book of Maccabees, was continued in the Old Testament beyond the time of the King James Version. Uh, Luther rejected the Apocalypse of John completely, and there's been controversy over many of these books. Actually, in addition to the Apocrypha as we know, there are a, a number of volumes, and some of the early fathers included among the Christian documents the writings of Valentinus and Basilides, the Gnostics of Alexandria. They were quite justified in doing so, and the recent discovery of the Gnostic Library proves that as early as the 4th century, which is the time under consideration, these Gnostic books had many references to the life of Christ, to the ministry, and in the case of the Pista Sophia, which is certainly of the 3rd to 4th century, there is a detailed section devoted to the instruction given by Jesus to Mary of Magdala. Therefore, many of the Gnostic writings, both the Christian Gnosis and the Jewish Gnosis, do overlap and do definitely have references to the life of Jesus and his teachings. Those that have survived to us under more or less special headings, uh, for the most part, have been decided to be of an optimistic nature by uh, church historians in general. And most of the apocryphal lives of Jesus gave strong emphasis to his childhood, which is comparatively weak in the Gospel versions. They also indicate that as a small child he performed numerous miracles, of which one, of course, was the creation of clay pigeons which came to life and flew, and several other similar episodes. Also, it is apparent from these early writings that there is no overshadowing of tragedy in most of them. They do not go into the tragedies of the effort to disseminate them, the ministry. Among the most interesting probabilities on, in connection with the apocryphal writing is to consider whether they formed a tone or an underlying quality which the orthodox theologians were afraid of. And uh, this is perhaps best noted in the Gospel of Nicodemus, uh, which is very interesting and does include the death of Jesus and the descent into the underworld and the harrowing of hell, in which he went down. And uh, the discussions between the evil spirits of hell and the Messiah are very cur curious. But one of the most interesting is that the spirits of evil, speaking of sinners in their domains after death, said that they would be punished until it was time for them to be reborn again into the material world. This probably cost Nicodemus inclusion in the scriptures, because the orthodox community was too severe on these particular points. There are many other similar interesting episodes and some very controversial ones. One of the most interesting and stimulating groups consists of the letters of Paul and to Paul in relation to Seneca. According to one of the apocryphals, Seneca, a Roman philosopher of considerable esteem, wrote many letters to Paul, the apostle, and in turn he wrote to Seneca. The tone of the uh, apocryphal book is to the effect that Seneca if not a convert, was very sympathetic to the Christian cause. And uh, there was considerable discussion of fine points of theology. 
but for the most part, the letters were of a kind of general, kindly and constructive uh, attitude throughout the story. Another interesting group of material deals with the life of Pilate after uh, the crucifixion of Christ. According to this particular little apocryphal section, he was returned to Rome, where he was made accountable to the emperor for his conduct. He took with him the seamless coat of Jesus, and uh, whenever he was called into the presence of the emperor, he wore this coat. And while he wore this coat, the emperor could not convict him. So the emperor made arrangements for the coat to be taken away at a certain time. Then he, Pilate was convicted and executed for his bad judgment in connection with the death of Jesus. This becomes the basis of quite an elaborate structure in one of the apocryphal sections. We also have, of course, a number of the apocryphal books traced directly to the other disciples beside the evangelists. In other words, that uh, uh, St. Andrew contributed, uh, Barnabas, who was with Paul for a long time, did the book that by his name among the Apocrypha, and the books of Hermas are very interesting and important, the Proevangelum of the pseudo Matthew. Many of these works are probably worthy of inclusion in the present scriptural collection. There, however, if we study them very carefully, we are forced to admit that they do not add a great deal of specialized information. There is a legendary quality about many of them. They, however, nearly always are in conformity with the four Gospels and the Pauline epistles. They represent various extensions or amplifications of some of the ideas in the accepted canon. So we don't find anything that is going to finally solve any major controversy concerning the life of Christ. But we do find abundant evidence to support the major historical events related in the Gospels. We also find that there seems to be an effort, or was an effort, to dep depreciate mysticism and a major, at least oblique, attack on the Egyptian Neoplatonism. Uh, the philosophy side of the Christian doctrine, as it gradually developed through Aquinas and St. Augustine, does not have much bearing in the apocryphal works. They are purely devotional and would appear to be based upon each other into a large degree. They are, however, very interesting and quite important in their contributions to our general knowledge. I think one point that uh, was made by uh, Constantine it should be of great interest today. Constantine was by no means an extraordinarily noble character. Constantine was probably interested in Christianity primarily as a means of supporting his control of the empire. He was not a particularly virtuous man. In fact, he was either convicted or accused of a great many rather despicable acts. He was not able to be initiated into the Eleusinian mysteries in, in, in his own country because of his bad reputation. But uh, Constantine did have one very interesting remark to make, and it was in the, about 320 that he made it. And it was uh, a remark that I think is of still a great importance. He said, why does this new religion place so much emphasis upon theology and breaks itself into splinters due to its theological differences when it was evidently intended by the founder, as found in the four Gospels, to improve the moral life of man to increase his spiritual insight and to advance the cause of universal brotherhood without consideration for various sectarian differences. Now, coming from a man who was not baptized practically until his deathbed, this is a very interesting thought. And it seems as though we can take that thought and precipitate it into the history of, of the Western religions and find how many times uh, antagonism, suffering, 
have been caused by theological differences. Differences which had little or nothing to do with the daily life of a good Christian. So in this time, perhaps, uh, in these difficult days that we are in at the moment, it would be wise for us to recognize what, what Constantine saw and several other things that perhaps were shown to him clearly by Eusebius, who was, of course, also responsible for the uh, Nicene Creed, uh, uh, the uh, creed of his own church, little church, which was finally imposed upon all of Christendom. According to Constantine, the unity of a religious group, the unity of religion within an empire or a a country is essential. The presence of a religion in a country is absolutely necessary. Now, regardless of how we may view him, he was a practical man. He said when religion is debased, the government of a nation becomes impossible. That as long as people are divided concerning their belief in God, they are also going to be divided in everything else. Now, these thoughts probably come essentially from Eusebius, who was the mouth for Constantine on his religious matters. But Constantine agreed with them, justified them, and promulgated them, and insisted upon them. He could look back uh, upon the Roman period in which Christians were thrown to the lions in the arena. He had already, long before this, declared religious tolerance throughout the empire. Now he saw that this religious tolerance was permitting permitting individuals to variously distort religion to the advancement of their own conclusions. Uh, Constantine, not being a philosopher, not being essentially a mystic, probably had very little insight into the deeper and more subtle values of spiritual conviction. But he did see the effect of various religious mistakes upon the secular life of humanity. And uh, those who came after him uh, recognize his importance in the great council which he convened, but have paid very little attention to his thoughts about what religion was to be in the life of mankind. It's all summed up in his one major overthought. They needed Christianity in the Roman Empire to hold it together. And all the rest uh, was an expansion of this concept. Now, it was also true that there was, had already been a considerable amount of conflict, misery, and suffering caused by religious differences within the boundaries of the empire. So what uh, Constantine was anxious to have accomplished was that there be a a uniformity of belief that the Christians were to get together and decide what they believed for once and for all, and having decided it, lived it. This was the important consideration. So the Nicene Council had its part to play, but at the best as we know it from the records of this, which is, I say, very meager, there is very little indication that the various delegates went back and fulfilled the expectations or hopes of Constantine. They went back to nurse their wounds and bruises and had a position very similar to that of a politician today who finds that his constituency no longer agrees with him. They were in this kind of a situation. For 250 years, some of these little churches had followed their own beliefs. Four or five generations of leaders had believed those very same things. The present incumbent believed these very things, but he was supposed to go back to his congregation and say he was wrong. Well, this is hard to do. Politically, it's almost impossible. If you uh, have made a mistake, you defend it at all costs in order to save your own reputation. And this happened in a good many cases. But all in all, there was an improvement. There was a general recognition of the four Gospels, and although by the end of the fourth century A.D. there probably were not a dozen copies of them in existence, 
the influence and implications of them through the more advanced clergy was being felt completely throughout the empire. It was a time in which what we know as the beginnings of formal Christianity, and we then move from the anti-Nicene period to the post-Nicene fathers, who began to expand. Uh, the anti-Nicene, those before the Council of Nicaea, were, might we say, apologists. They were trying to get along with a non-Christian environment. They were therefore, as in the case of Clement of Alexandria in origin, forced to make certain compromises. They couldn't really come out and call everybody else wrong. So they were careful to try not to offend everybody. But at, after the Nicene Council, the apologists faded away and the uh, propagandists moved in with everything they had and uh, insisted upon this uniformity and conformity of belief. Now, if it is true, as which it looks as though it was, that from the very beginning there was also a stream of mysticism, which perhaps, if we, if we can hazard the thought, was carried along largely by the so-called rejected books, with most of the books no longer in existence. We do not know the full details, but the limited quotations, the small fragments that have come down to us in the writings of the Church Fathers, who were able probably to trace the originals, would indicate that there was a definite mystical content coming into the Christian faith at a comparatively early date. The apocryphal books, particularly those dealing with the life of Christ, also indicate a greater use of miracles, many wonderful happenings that have never gotten into the uh, orthodox gospels, uh, strange circumstances, natural phenomena, and all kinds of mysterious, mystical, almost magical elements. And it is probably because of these inclusions that many of the books were rejected for nonconformity. But even though this conformity was not acceptable, there is no doubt in the world that by the fourth century, Christian mysticism was reasonably firmly established. It was based upon one essential point, namely the possibility of interpreting various statements of the scriptures in a metaphysical manner. That while all things had their literal forms, it was quite possible that these literalisms were symbolical of something else, that everything was not to be taken literally. Most of the early fathers expected everyone to take these ideas literally. But as time went on, even before Nicaea, there is a strong evidence that in Egypt and in Athens, there was a metaphysical element coming in. And this metaphysical element was probably preserved in the Gospels most completely in the letters of Paul to the Corinthians. Here we have a considerable statement of a mysticism which also occurs in other of the Pauline writings which are now regarded as apocryphal. So we have the rise of a Christian mysticism. We also find that gradually the Church accepted this. It accepted the possibility of a mystical experience in itself. And gradually, the canonization of prominent church fathers depended on one of two factors, either martyrdom, which was the larger one, or a mysterious mystical experience of communion with deity. These two were the basic elements which contributed to canonization. Now, Christian mysticism has come down to us today. It has come down to us within the Catholic Church and also within the Protestant churches. In both of these communions, the mysticism has been largely censored by the doctrines of the uh, sectarian itself. But in spite of this, a constantly increasing mysticism is evident. Now, one of the reasons why mysticism comes in is because with the passing of time and the changes of history, literalism loses dignity. Today, things that were accepted without question 100, 200 years ago are simply no longer tolerated. Interpretations that are completely literal, 
have run against scientific, philosophical, and theological objections. So we have a tendency which began at the very early time uh, to interpret all of the essential principles of religion in a mystical manner. This is also justified by the actual words of Christ himself. For he tells it on one occasion that if they destroy the temple, he will rebuild it in three days. And someone said he means the temple of his own body. And this is an example of the departure from a literalism to an idealism that was compatible with the gradual advancement and, and unfoldment of human understanding. We also find that throughout the apocryphal books, there are to be found a number of apocalyptical experiences of beings lifted up into communion with deity. Uh, the only one of these books that survived in the Holy Scriptures, the Apocalypse attributed to John. But there was one by Peter, there was one by Paul, there were several others by other disciples, and some by early church fathers. These experiences seem to be an effort uh, to recognize the spirituality of the universe. In the days of the Egyptians and the Greeks, the idea of a physical universe with nothing but a physical foundation was unthinkable. And even the fathers of astronomy, Ptolemy of Alexandria, for example, recognized the idea that the physical universe was the shadow of a spiritual world. It was something cast upon the face of nature, which had its origin in a divine purpose or a divine plan. So the most of the apocalyptical visions found in the apostles and in the commentaries and the apocryphal works were based upon a system or concept of astronomy which had developed in Greece and Egypt and in Chaldea. We also realize that the apocalypse is very similar in its structure to the Muslim vision of the ascent of Muhammad into heaven. Uh, the uh, idea is found also in the Kabbalah and in the early mysticism of, of the Jewish Kabbalists. In any event, the whole concept was, in all of these works, that the universe was a spiritual reality, that the physical forms that it existed were symbols, evidences of something greater than themselves. The uh, point of view that the universe was created out of nothing was held for a time by the early church but gradually relaxed away because it was simply not possible to assume that something comes from nothing. But in any, in any event, the main theme of the situation was represented by John, uh, by John in the Apocalypse is that life is a spiritual mystery, that re religion is the recognition of the reality of things unseen, that man himself is a spiritual factor moving through a spiritual world, but this truth is obscured by the restrictions of his own sensory perceptions. Therefore, the early communion had to believe and affirm, as is represented on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel in Rome, that the divine power of fashioning things, creating things, was in truth a deity, not merely a law, not merely a mechanics going on forever through time and space, that there was a divine mind and a divine consciousness and a divine soul behind the mystery of existence, and that the manifestation of this divinity was particularly summarized in the ministry of Jesus Christ so that uh, the apocalyptical books all have this flavor, but do not fully mature it. One of the reasons why they did not mature it was because to do so, they would have been required to accept certain non-Christian principles, already well known in circulation in the areas. So it was best not to do, go into detail on this, but to maintain the simple fact, undeniable and irrefutable, that the universe is essentially a spiritual reality. Most of the apocalyptical writings assume this. 
the Apocrypha intimate it. And they also intimate in various ways the importance of the individual's acceptances of certain truths. I think we may also say that the apocryphal books contain a number of allegories like the accepted volumes, which require interpretation to even make reasonable sense. Uh, they are parables, they are symbols, they are myths, legends, all of which, however, are founded in the spiritual fact of man's existence in a divine plan. Now today there's another kind of controversy that has arisen, which is no longer relating either to the uh, uh, accepted Gospels or the possibility of enlargement through apocryphal means. The uh, head-on collision today is between what we might term materialism and idealism. Uh, the non-believers of antiquity were regarded as heretics. The non-believers of today pride themselves that they are scientific intellectualists. They believe what they believe. Just as all these little uh, priests and bishops back uh, in the third century and fourth century believed what they believed. Non-believers of antiquity were regarded as heretics. The non-believers of today pride themselves that they are scientific intellectualists. They believe what they believe. Just as all these little uh, priests and bishops back uh, in the third century and fourth century believe what they believed. It is a series of believings. And the Apocalypse of uh, John and the Apocryphal writings together both challenge these acceptances of things in common circulation but without any foundation in essential realities. Even in the times of Origen and uh, St. Athanasius uh, there was a certain misgiving about the acceptances of the past in, in its orthodox form. That because something had always been believed did not make it infallible. It was only infallible if it was true. And it was very difficult to prove or justify some of the prevailing beliefs which were holding uh, control of public minds even in the third and fourth century. Today we have another head-on problem, but we have not yet developed a Constantine to handle it. And uh, this problem is simply that a world divided between belief and unbelief is in a very serious condition because it provides the grounds for all kinds of fanaticism, terrorism, and disillusionment in every area of life. Constantine liked to believe and more or less affirmed the fact that these differences are simply relatively unimportant that the only things that are important are the unities, the things which are generally accepted. Constanza, the daughter of Constantine, finally convinced Arias uh, to come into some kind of a compromised decision with Alexander. And perhaps it was her charm or perhaps it was her piety, for she was a Christian that finally an arrangement of arbitration was achieved, but in this arbitration it was never consummated because Arias died in Constantinople while on his way to be restored to his official dignities. This was the end of the one heresy, but it was the parent of many heresies that go on all the way through not only the Christian faith but most of the religions of the world. Every religion has had a council at somewhere along the line to try to straighten out its problems. And these problems are all based upon the lack of evidence that is generally acceptable concerning divine matters. To find a, an agreement between persons of different convictions, different ages, different races, different nations, these differences, how to reconcile them. 
Well, there's only one way that we have found up to date now in connection with this type of problem, and that is tolerance. The individual must recognize the rights of other people to believe according to their own beliefs. It is also very much more important to challenge the individual on the level of conduct, because there he can prove or disprove the integrity of his convictions. He may believe what he pleases, but his religion is revealed by what he does in action. And there can be no doubt that on this ground a compatibility is possible. If we judge a person by his merits alone, we can then have some confidence in his creed. The American Indian took this attitude completely. He never questioned the, re the religion of a stranger. All he did was watch. And if the conduct was good, the stranger was good. And if he was good, the thing he believed had to be good. So that uh, in this way, a lot of controversy was uh, eliminated. Again today, we have uh, the same problem that the Nicene Fathers faced, and namely that there are a large number of schismatic fragments of all the religions that break away on some point of difference. Constantine thought most of these points of difference were rather unrealistic, and that others would not be solvable by the human mind that some things had to be accepted by faith, and by faith alone. And that if faith was strong, the individual was strengthened. If his faith was weakened, his morality collapses. So it is faith but which must take the place of knowledge in the study of the ultimates. The ultimate nature of deity, the ultimate purpose for the world, the ultimate end of man, these situations can be verbalized into more or less parables or simplifications, but the facts are beyond human conception. And these facts are not necessary. Man never needs to, be, uh, to know more than he can reasonably learn in order to live as well as he can reasonably be expected to live. So from, the, from that time on to here, we find this long shadow of an old problem that is being more or less born again. This year the world has many people with good ideals, with high hopes and severe and conscientious principles, and yet the great bodies of mankind, both religious and secular, have not been properly reconciled. Unless they are reconciled, they cannot lead the way to a world peace or a universal enlightenment. Education has certain advantages over theology because it deals mostly with things which can be demonstrated up to a certain point. And uh, education generally quietly uh, 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 neglects or denies that which it cannot reach. But uh, today, the, tr the struggle between materialism and idealism it goes on because of the failure of human beings to sit down together and attempt the reconciliation of their differences. Perhaps the nearest thing we have today to the Council of Nicaea is the United Nations organization. And the delegates there too are very much like the bishops of the fourth century. And most of them are writing letters criticizing each other. But the fact man is true that something must be done to reconcile the common differences of mankind. And among these differences there is a violence, there is a tyranny of attitudes, there is an unwillingness to arbitrate, there is a determination to live or die on a certain point or condition. In most cases the elements involved are not especially valuable. When I was in New York a number of years ago, uh, I gave a series of lectures in a building there which was devoted very largely uh, to philosophical discussions of one kind or another. And I learned while there that two very important sects of philosophical thinkers had wanted to use the facilities of this building. They had wanted to have the right to go their own meetings there. 
But in both cases, it was understood that they could not possibly do it if the other group was admitted. Even if it was a different day, a different place, a different time, if one was admit, in, uh, admitted, the other would refuse to come. And that was in the recent years. So this, this type of thing is slow in breaking down. There are evidences that it is becoming somewhat better. And there are now groups that are able to get together who had no common ground 50 years ago. But the great problem still remains. The four or five great religions of the world all have essentially the same teachings. And as one great scholar of the past said, there are 70 names of God, but only one God. There are many faiths, but only one reality behind them all. And we have been divided for centuries by names and words. We have thought if the word was different, they were talking about a different thing. But this is not true. The one great thing that we have to learn is the divine law governing life. And we have to learn to get together and serve that law together and in cooperative relationships. World Fellowships of Faith, I attended the World High Congress of Religions and many other groups trying to work out these problems. They have strong support from minority groups, from those who are not prejudiced, but the rest are in the same bad spot as that which confronted Constantine in 325 A.D. The situation must be clarified. We cannot permit this difference of opinion. We cannot permit any unreasonable, unfair condemnation of an individual on a, on a principle which does not involve ethics or morality or integrity. Integrity we may demand. Ethics we may hope for. In, we may hope for honesty and consecration and sincerity. Uh, but we cannot uh, expect complete agreement unless we broaden the foundation, enlarge the structure until it is in inclusively possible to get everything into it. Now, uh, at this time, uh, we are gathered uh, to celebrate uh, the birthday of the greatest figure in the history of humanity. And the power of this figure in the transforming of the life of mankind cannot be overestimated. All the words that were written about him, all the Gospels that try to interpret him, are secondary to the miracle of the fact itself. We found finally a voice that was the loudest voice that the world has ever heard, a voice which is still strong enough to control the religious life or influence the religious life of over half of the human race. Now this power lies not in wealth, in militarism, despotism, or physical authority, but in the magnificent example which reaches into our lives and hearts and inspires us to do likewise. We are in the presence of a magnificent symbol of man's proper way of life the constant recognition of, one, of loving one another, of serving truth, of sacrificing self for the common good, and for the recognition of the divine in all of its manifestations in all the areas of experience and phenomena. Recognizing this, we do have a tremendous uh, wealth, a wealth of spiritual integrities, a wealth that cuts through all of the racial and economic and social states of humanity. We have many groups in the Christian communion from other nations, other races, from far places, and every phase of human culture has been influenced. So therefore, we need now perhaps to learn the lesson of the Council of Nicaea, to learn the lesson of finding a way to codify the entire concept of man's life. Several efforts have been made to write a religious book, a, a universal religious book. My old friend Dr. Riley tried to do it. He called it a Bible of the world, in which the best sections of all sacred books are brought together. This was a very noble experiment. Many profited by it, but it was not strong enough 
to move the situation in the direction that it has to go. The constant effort of these different beliefs to dominate each other is not consistent with the future well-being of humanity. No one wants to take these beliefs away from them, but it is necessary that they also hold strong enough beliefs in common to make possible a close fraternization and a complete cooperation with the cause of world peace and the improvement of the social condition. This uh, goes back again to the mystical aspects of the early church as found perhaps best in Neoplatonism and in the doctrines of the Gnosis of, of uh, Valentinus and Basilides. These recognized a great chemistry, a kind of alchemy, and the alchemists had it. That was the transformation of human nature. The old beliefs of the mystics, both Christian and non-Christian, have descended into Europe through the great teachings of men like Bami and Paracelsus and Lully and other great leaders a mystical thought, a, a deeper meaning that the real problem is the transmutation of human nature and that the formation or universal reformation of humanity is the only solution to our problem. This was the original problem of the Gnosis and was one of the earliest problems of Christianity. The early church fathers believed firmly that the heavenly world would come to earth, that in due time and in due course there would be but one world, one humanity, living together in peace under one God. This dream still has validity. It is still something that we have to fight for or work for or struggle to attain. And uh, unfortunately, up to the present time, it's been a very difficult path. Actually, however, there is progress. And uh, the, uh, the consideration of further details concerning early Christian history will have quite a bearing upon the future. Because as we go back to the original revelation and get away from the interpretations, we find a more solid substance upon which to build a unity. Interpretations of all kinds can grow up around an idea. But these interpretations uh, are very conflicting and often contradictory. So if they can be eliminated and we go back to the idea in its own nature, in its own substance, in its own essence, we may find the common ground we need. We have to strip off centuries of interpretation to rescue the dream that was in the heart of the Christian religion. We are doing it in slow degrees, but it is coming. And when the time comes for it to really uh, play its vital role in the re reorganization of human society. It is only reasonable to hope that it will unite with all other faiths in the common purpose for which they all stand and will not hesitate simply because another faith has a different name. That we will no longer consider the heretics and the uh, non-believers. We will rather recognize that these are terms in our own minds, but that everywhere, from the beginning of time, religion has had one purpose, and that purpose was the improvement of the inner life of man. This is the thing that is most important. This is the emphasis that Paul made, both in his uh, accepted epistles and those which are in the Apocrypha, that the great problem of all time and all things is that we, both, that we all come together in the realization of the brotherhood of man and the fatherhood of God. Until this experience comes, we are not religious. The Gnostic Christians and some of the others uh, had a mystical baptism which is implied in some of the apocryphal writings, but not clearly set forth. In this mystical baptism, the individual simply stripped off all of the garments of his believing and went back to the source. That he was to start as a little babe again. But while he might be a grown person in body, he was a little child so long as his inner life was not strong enough to sustain him. 
The purpose of the child is to grow into an adult, an adult in whom the power of self-determination is sufficient to guide life. It is only the individual who can guide his own life and the way it should go who has any right to be regarded as mature or grown up in his concepts. So the ancient rites often reduced the person, again, to a kind of second child, as is the words of Jesus, that the kingdom of heaven is the kingdom of little children, and that these little children, growing up in the faith, growing up in idealism, growing up in integrities, would ultimately become mature, and in their maturity would work together with all of their kind for the preservation of humanity and the safety of those little children who had not yet grown up. Thus, the uh, purpose of the entire th situation still is what it was in the beginning, to answer a primary question, namely, is there a power of infinite good at the source of life? Is there a law that determines all action? Is, are there realities that cannot be denied? Are there laws governing personal conduct that cannot be violated without tragedy? And are these laws the representations of the consciousness of the creating power? Are we therefore living in a universe in which there is a law giver and we are expected to obey that law giver? This is against the concept that is held by some that we are in a universe of accidents and incidents that there is no rule governing every, anything, that the individual, while he is alive, is alive, and when he dies, he's dead, and that's all there is to it. This type of belief has made possible most of the miseries of the human race, and the idea that we must cling desperately to it, regardless of anything, is very much shadowed out again in the great argument between Arias and Alexander. Neither one would give a bit to the other. Neither one would admit that there could be anything wrong with his own interpretation of realities. As a result of that, the world has been locked, more or less, in a religious, scientific, philosophical, industrial, economic con conflict for thousands of years. The answer seems to be that everything that happens points towards what is necessary. It points to solution. And the individual very often simply glosses over it very quickly for fear he might be tempted to solve something. He wants to go on as he is. This condition goes through all departments of life, economic, social, cultural. But the time must come when through the experience of his own tragic mistakes, the human being comes back again to the realization that there is an archetype, there is a plan, there is a purpose. And those who are understanding and enlightened are either for this purpose or against it. And that there can be no compromise. We either must believe in the reality of the divine plan or disbelieve. If we believe, we have strength to meet many obstacles and problems with courage and integrity. If we do not believe, we find ourselves in a shipwrecked condition, in a world that is gradually falling apart. The apocryphal writings have been translated now from manuscripts in the Vatican and in several other great centers of culture. A number of them are available, one of them in the terms the lost books of the Bible. They are suitable to be read and considered. They do not contain a vast amount of new information. For the large part, they are examples of intensification or elucidation of material already in the Gospels. But they strive to fill in uh, breaks and uh, points which are not clearly defined. They seek to answer certain natural questions that arise from the accepted books themselves. There is not as great a sublimity in them as there is in some of the recorded Gospels. But they do represent uh, a, a striving after righteousness. They try to tell, sometimes almost like little children's fairy tales, things about Jesus and things about the lives of the apostles uh, that make these 
apostles and persons more available to us in their simple friendships and in their ordinary actions and conditions. Uh, there we have, of course, a considerable discussion of the life of the Virgin, uh, the gospel of the life of the Virgin. Uh, God carries through from the Old Testament and through practically everything that we find in the New Testament regarding the genealogy of Jesus. We also have all kinds of little additional things thrown in to uh, vitalize and make more interesting uh, these classical accounts. And uh, there is no doubt that many of these books would be a considerable inspiration to the average person. That they do indicate also that early there was a greater literature. But this greater literature, particularly in its more profound parts, is not present in the Apocrypha. The Apocrypha is a kind of commentary on the Gospels in substance and uh, with certain emendations, but with a slightly mystical flavor, a, a, a more miraculous approach, a reality of things that would be generally regarded today as magic or something of this nature. But the various divine personalities or worshipers or bishops are given powers and circumstances, and these in turn contributed to the Golden Legend, the first great book of the of, of Christian, we might say, mythology. Uh, Vortigern, in his Golden Legend, gives the lives of saints, the lives of martyrs. He is also the one who, for instance, gives us a clue to the sacred books of the Ethiopians. For there is another group of apocrypha that we haven't considered at all, and that is uh, books that arose in distant communions where the faith has remained unchanged for nearly 20 centuries. The Coptic Christianity of North Africa has its own commentaries, its own messengers, its own uh, teachers and heroes, but it is still dominated by the Christian Gospels. So there are all kinds of side writings, some of them quite old, others simply representing the piety and enthusiasm of uh, leaders of the 12th to 15th centuries. But in every case, there is something uh, that uh, gives a, a little new angle to the old problem. But mostly now, I think we are all concerned uh, with what is found in the Apocrypha as well as in the revealed Gospels or the accepted Gospels, is this great crisis, not as a prophetic thing, some have tried to make this crisis a dated prophecy, particularly in the book of Revelation. But it is not a dated prophecy. It is timeless. The conflict between the individual and the pressures of the opinions of others, this conflict has always existed. The desperate effort to maintain uniformity, even at the expense of progress, has also survived to us from the past. I think we do need, very definitely, a new concept of basic interpretation. We do not need to touch the scriptures themselves, but we need to create a text dealing with the use of them in the immediate problems of international affairs. We need to help people uh, in this world to recognize that they shouldn't drive a car under the influence of alcohol, that they should take care of their children properly, that they should produce entertainment that is fit to see, and that always the man is responsible to a divine law and a divine purpose. But he will not serve that purpose or that law unless he believes in it. And in lacking belief, he must live with the consequences of his disbelief. And this consequence is very serious. So it, as then, so now, for nearly 1,800 years, the Christian authority has been diminished by feudalism. It has been dis damaged by conflict within itself, conflicts that have never really been solved, some of them partly arbitrated so that people can get along in the same community without actually warring over it. But still in the lives of many people, their own peculiar creed is true and all others are untrue. As long as this remains as it is, the munition makers will have a busy day. 
as long as we permit differences in our personal convictions to destroy friendships, break up homes, and damage characters, we cannot blame others for the difficulties that follow. We are now very much in need of what Constantine recognized so long ago. We need of getting together all of those of good spirit and letting their power be available to that more legitimate leadership, which might, in turn, finally solve the present problem. In other words, if the leaders believe in the people, and the people believe in their leaders, things will go better. But the only way this can be accomplished is if the people and the leaders both believe in principles and believe in the integrities and values of life upon which civilization must stand. So now we have another Christmas season coming to us out of the past, an opportunity to restate in our own lives values which inwardly we know to be true, but we have never allowed them to really interfere with doing as we please. The time has come, I think, to think of Christmas more as a rededication, a recognition of an eternal value a value which we can reject and perish or accept and live. That the teachings that are essential were not essentially given to the world by only one teacher. Honesty is a world conviction. Kindness is a world conviction. Buddhism is waiting for the Lord Maitreya, whose name means kindness. And kindness is to be the coming savior of mankind. Whether we call it the Lord Maitreya or the Messiah, it remains the same thing, for it is the quality, the principle, and the energy which the word symbolizes that doeth the works. It is not the word. So everywhere we are waiting for world peace, world understanding, world cooperation. We are seeking to feed the hungry and fulfill all of those requirements which Jesus bestowed upon his apostles. And in order to do these things, we, not, we must begin to think in terms of solution and realize that while this may be a little difficult, while we may find it hard to give up some of our pet notions or to share our goods with the unfortunate, that in the long run it is the virtue of the truly religious person to work constantly against the selfishness in himself and to go, gradually recover from the blind spot which he has permitted to develop, in which he is able to live his daily life without consideration for the spiritual importance of the things that happen. The happenings of daily life are symbols of the quality of human attainment. And where the happening comes to sorrow, it means there's something wrong in the conduct of the person. A sorrowful, weeping world, a world that has departed from principles, can only come back to those principles and survive. Therefore, at Christmas, we are constantly reminded of an eternal mystery, the mystery of the love of deity manifesting upon all planes of existence. And this so happens that if the de love of deity is with us, our love should be with deity, with the do doing the works, so that in a little way at least, we are all bishops. We are all members of a kind of world clergy in which our dedication is primarily to the works of righteousness. If these thoughts can be strong in our hearts and minds at this time during the Christmas season, I think we will be more serious. We will still enjoy the good. But let us remember that when we give presents, and in a sense these presents are intended to represent rewards. The little boy who is naughty is not supposed to get a Christmas present. The grown man who is naughty is not expected or not able to claim a happy life, the respect and love of his friends and family. We are rewarded by the mysterious gifts of grace that react from our own conduct. And each, each individual who lives a little nearer to the truth will find in himself that he is a little nearer to peace, security, happiness, and world unity. These are the things that we must give consideration to, especially this year. For we see now, that, as never before perhaps, the dangers of selfishness and materialism. 
They simply will not operate. And unless we are able to do a little better with the subject, uh, we are going to drift along to one tragedy after another. It is not the name of the power we believe that is the most important. It is that our belief leads to obedience. That what we know to be true, we do. And this is the part of life that is, is important to us, because most of us do know better than we do. And if we do what we do know, we will know more. For each development of character releases from within ourselves a new wealth of mystical overtones and insights and understandings. So we'd like to wish for all of you this year a new dedication to the great principles of truth, new friendship, the ability to say more and more that there is no belief in the world that you are going to criticize, that you are going to do everything possible to help everyone live his beliefs in terms of the one truth behind them all. And that if we will overlook appearances and stay with principles, we can accomplish something for nearly everyone who comes into our lives. So having a deep insight into meaning yourself, into the realization that if we love truth, we will keep its commandments. And if we believe in Christ, we will keep his commandments. If we will kind of make this a living, firm establishment within ourselves, we'll have a better new year and the whole world will be better. For there is not one single good deed committed by one person that does not contribute to the final perfection of the human race. So with these thoughts, our blessings are with you for this holy season.